Um, now, remember I said um, um, I, I was going to give you a surprise. I had a few people coming up to me. They like their Chrissy presents. They want to make sure they get them. I want to tell you about one of the products that Vecchi uh, and the Lone Doctor have is a product called the Lone Doctor Statement Surgeon Program. Now, it's a very, very unique piece of software. And this software, it's your chance to find out if the banks have been ripping you off and how you can get your money back quickly and easily. Who thinks that sometimes banks could make mistakes and if they do, they might likely be in their favour? Who believes that could be the case? Really, yep. So if you think the bank's making mistakes, your loan chances are you're right. The Statement Surgeon software program makes it easy to detect bank errors. It's user-friendly, has screen prompts that guide you through the auditing process. It even comes with help tips, so it's even got this online manual that shows you how to use it, right? It's really good software. The tutorial will walk you through the process of completing your audit and sending a letter to your bank and even requesting a refund. And even um, if the bank doesn't do the refund, it actually then takes you to the next step of generating a letter with all the information you've already typed in to the ombudsman. And from a banker's perspective, I know exactly what the process is once it goes to the ombuds when it gets very expensive very quickly for the bank. So they will certainly sit up and take notice. If you find a discrepancy between the interest calculations generated by the program and those shown on your bank statements, then you've just found a potential error. Would you believe that um, people sometimes don't even fully look at their loan offer documentation? And even if they do, they don't remember it on an ongoing basis. They don't remember the exact interest rate, the fees, etc. I remember the very first home loan that my partner at the time, or my ex-partner, and I actually went for, the bank got it wrong three times, the offer document. You know, first it was the wrong names, then it was the wrong interest rates, then it was the wrong type of loan, right? So they just kept getting it wrong. So again, my, my question comes back to, is it possible for banks where humans work and humans who set up the systems to get to get it wrong, to maybe make a mistake, yes or no? Right, it happens all the time, but people don't know. Why don't they know? Imagine there's a mistake. You're all intelligent people in this room, right? Why don't I even check? I, I know how to use Excel. But do you think I'm going to spend the time generating an Excel spreadsheet that I can type everything into, even if I had the knowledge and the skill and know that banks make mistakes, do you think I'd bother? I'm too busy doing other things. So... That's right, even if the mistakes occurred 5, 10, 15 years ago, the program shows how much interest um, the money's owed you and the bank has to pay it back, right? So, and imagine some of you in this room have more than one home loan, correct? And many of you in this room expect to have more than however many loans you've got now to have them in the future. Imagine having some software that helps you audit that, not just now, but for all the future properties you're likely to own. Do you think that could be of major benefit to you? Well... The program, as I said, generates a little of the ombudsman. Have you looked at your loan statement Think you should be way ahead in terms of your repayments only to find you've hardly made a dent, right? Even after years of hard work and pouring money into your loan month after month, have you ever asked, have you ever had that sneaking suspicion that your bank is making mistakes with its calculations? Um, working on the banking side, um, I've actually received checks from ANZ and NAB because, you know, someone found out there was a problem, they fixed it, and then they were obliged to send the checks out, even without me asking it. Now, working on the other side of the counter, because I've actually owned uh, a bank as a franchise at North Sydney, like I know that things happen in the computer systems. Right? I'm not saying which bank, though, makes mistakes, because they all do, because they rely on human beings inputting things, they rely on human beings setting up the systems, and they rely on human beings maintaining those systems. No, they would never make a mistake. No, Bank Queens, they would never, I'm sure, never make a mistake. Uh, I'm sure they wouldn't, okay? Um, <laughs> the reality is if you've had these thoughts, you're probably more than 50% chance of being right. Why is it more than 50% chance of being right? In 1997, Sydney Morning Herald did a small survey. They reported um, that 54% of all bank statements audited had errors in them, and of those errors, surprise, surprise, the vast majority were in the bank's favour. Now, that probably doesn't surprise you. Right? But that was just out of a sample. So if you extrapolate that, probably half the people in this room, probably just over half who have got loans, have probably got a mistake in them somewhere along the line. And those mistakes tend to compound over time. And if you have more than one loan, it starts adding up quite substantially and quite quickly. 
The statement surgeon program has been developed and reviewed by a leading Melbourne accounting firm to validate the calculations performed by the software accurate. Right? Means that if the, state, so the statement surgeon finds errors, you can confidently go back to the bank. Because they'll say, if you did it on an Excel spreadsheet, they go, oh, you probably made a mistake. But if it's commercial software that's been independently ordered by an accounting firm to show that the accounting system is correct, they don't have a lot of legs to stand on. Would you agree with that? It's much more powerful. Um, these are just um, some things. Uh, the, the Fin Review, the bank has admitted that a large part of hundreds of interest charge calculations could be wrong. Colonial said the bank's expert had looked at disputed interest calculations, admitted there were errors, we're now looking at quantifying that overcharging. There's plenty of, if you, if you read the banking and financial papers around this, it actually happens more often than what most people realise. Um, it just doesn't make big press anymore. Right. How do these occur errors occur? There are a host of reasons why. The wrong interest rate is applied to your loan initially. Instead of seven and a half, it could be a typo, it should have been seven and a quarter percent. Daily interest rates incorrectly calculated as a result of leap years. Um, bank systems sometimes don't take those into account properly. Offset account miscalculations. Interest is incorrectly calculated and offset against home loans with an offset account. I've often found that um, the bank may have taken a charge by mistake out of your account at the wrong time, it's then generated a, um, a fee and that fee you're paying interest on, which you never should have in the first place and it just keeps compounding. Um, interest rate charges being applied too early or too late. There are lots of reasons. The bank incorrectly credits or debits money to your account. This, this happens often. Wrong bank fees applied. I've seen situations where I'm on a professional choice package with a certain bank, they still charge me fees and that gets added to the loan and just keeps compounding every month, every year that I've had that loan and it should never in the first place. Um, interest being charged at least one day earlier than it should be. Penalty rates incorrectly applied. Often because of their mistakes, they then charge you penalty interest or penalty fees and then you pay interest on top of that. Do the ranks really pay you back? The short answer is yes, they have to. If they choose not to, you just escalate it straight to the ombudsman. As part of this, uh, I'm going to just probably recap some of the things that I covered at the two-day event in terms of vowels, but very briefly, I want to add some more stuff and some more breadth and depth to it. So one of the first things, um, remember why is vowels so important? Why is the valuation so important? So it's borrowing power, but it helps you create the what? What have, what have I talked about? Gap. This is essential for gap. And one of the most important things about gap is that the banks consider whatever the valuer writes down as gospel. So that's why you've got to get into this process beforehand and make sure that you're controlling it as much as possible because once it gets to that vowel, it is virtually impossible to change it. Does that make sense? All right. So um, I've added two slides to this. I want you to just write this into your books. The market value principle. Market value principle. The estimated amount for which an asset should exchange on the date of valuation between a willing buyer and a willing seller in an arm's length transactions after proper marketing wherein the parties had each acted knowledgeably, prudently and without compulsion. The Australian Property Institute has a definition pretty much like that, and that's what valuers use as their guiding principle when they are valuing a property. And that sort of sentence pretty much sums up what a valuation is all about and what they base it on. Okay, so why do you get a valuation done? What are the key reasons why you would get valuations done? Well, it's um, to check your contract price, see if it makes sense. And by the way, can valuers value something that uh, doesn't exist yet? Like off the plan? Yes. Of course they can. So if you didn't know that, make sure you write that down. Valuers are quite capable of doing valuations off the plan. In fact, there's a company called Charter Keck Kramer, not the real estate agency, but Charter Keck Kramer, the valuer, used to be part of Heron Todd White Valuations. They are in Victoria here. Um, they're probably one of the largest. Not all companies can do, actually this is something you should need to understand, not all valuers can do valuations off the plan. Some of them have different niches. Some of them just do residential existing, some of them do maybe commercial, some of them do maybe farmland, some of them do plant and stock as part of a, an ongoing business. You have to get clear that there are different types of values. Now there's a, a lot of uh, professional indemnity insurance that you need uh, to do off the plan valuations. That's why Charter Keck Kramer uh, is one of the biggest in Victoria, just as an example. Right now, why value 
anything? Well, sometimes you want to check the contract price. Other times you're doing a refinance. So part of the refinance is getting a reval done, then taking that to your bank and getting it uh, refinanced. Other times, if you're looking at doing construction, you maybe want to get some idea of the construction costs um, and um, progress. As you go along, often you'll use a quantity surveyor to say that you're up to this point and this amount's taken off, but sometimes, and Scott alluded to this, sometimes valuers are used, there's a bit of a grey area um, when it's determining which stage is up to, you know, slab, frame, roof on, um, lock up, the, the final fittings, etc., and the finishes. Then you may also have, and this is something that you guys will probably want to look at, is the realisation. Um, what is the end val? So if a development is undertaken, how much will it yield in, in terms of dollars? So if you've got plans, you've got a site, what's the end valuation likely to be? And for these sorts of valuations, these are not done by someone who's junior. This is done by a very senior valuer, right? And these actually cost a fair bit of money because they're very long, and I'll explain that in a moment. But before I explain that, let's just talk about what are valuer metrics. Now, valuers... There's three common metrics they use. The most common one that you're probably used to is comp sales. Right? The other one that you're probably very familiar with is um, rent multiples. And the third one that they often use is um, dollars per square metre. Now, they'll also use some other methodologies, such as replacement cost, but it's not a common one. Quantity surveyors are more likely to use replacement costs. Valuers are looking at, well, what is it in the market? Because is it possible for things to be valued at something below replacement cost? Well, it's happening in some parts of southwestern Sydney right now. So a value is looking at the economy more than the actual replacement cost of the items, which is what quantity surveyors look at. Does that make sense? They have a different philosophy of where they look for the numbers. Okay? So real estate agents wouldn't necessarily look at what does it cost to replace something. They'll look at what is the market paying for that asset at the moment. And that's what valuers are more looking at as well. Does that make sense? Whereas a quantity surveyor has a different perspective. Okay? Now, all right. So... In terms of these three different types of metrics, and these are the three main metrics. Don't worry, everyone else will get a turn later on to meet developers and chat and negotiate, but um, you're left with me. Let's go. <laughs> Is that all right? <laughs> all right. In, ter <laughs> in terms of value and metrics, um, these three different methodologies are often used across different types of properties. So comp sales is generally used on residential The rent multiples is often used on commercial. And the dollars per square metre is generally used on land. Okay? So that's predominantly where those metrics are used when valuing the appropriate type of um, asset. Okay? Now, has everyone got that? Bless you. Has everyone got that down? Nearly? Okay. Now, is it possible sometimes that you use one method as opposed to another method on, like for instance, on a residential property, could you use, in terms of valuing, a um, property that's residential using dollars per square metre? Absolutely, and they do. So as an example, in apartments, what they'll do is they'll work out a dollars per square metre for one bedders, or a one, or dollars per square metre for two bedders, and then if there's another two better in that development or across the road or something like that, because this property may not necessarily have sold, but they've got maybe um, contracts that haven't settled, they may work out the dollars per square metre that that was sold for or exchanged for but not settled, and then they may actually apply the dollars per square metre rate for the similar level of fixtures and fittings for a property maybe across the road or adjacent in the same building. Does that make sense? So sometimes you will get... Um, Value is, and that's why they go to university for four years to understand all of these sorts of metrics and how to actually apply them in the most appropriate ways. Make sense so far? Okay. Now, let's talk about the different types of vowels, right? And you should write this down as well, that in terms of residential vowels, there's a number of types of vowels, and these are the most common types of vowels. Um, you'll have a full report, which will probably go up to about 14 pages, You'll have a normal bank vowel, which will only be about, I've seen them as short as two, but they're usually about three to four pages. Um, curbside vowels may still only be two or three pages, but they don't have as much um, 
detail in them as a, a proper bank vowel. But curbside vowels are very often used when the bank is just expecting a low LVR because the bank just needs to know that their risk is covered. Does that make sense? So if they're not lending a lot relative to the price of the property, they don't need a full inspection. They don't need to know everything. Does everybody follow that? Then what's starting to happen is you're getting desktop vowels. And this is generally done by, um, CBA is probably the biggest one that's doing them, and they've received a, a bit of flack from the Reserve Bank of Australia, because what generally happens is that they don't even visit the site. What they normally do is they just go on to the land property information or whatever the, the public database for the property record sales are in your jurisdiction. They check those out. They may ring some of the agents and they check Australian property monitors. They literally don't leave the office. They do it virtually or electronically. They've been able to find that that comes within 10% of the actual price of that property. Does that make sense? Sure, sure but that's, I'm talking about a desktop vowel. Do you remember? The electronic version only, not, not one of these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But CBA have the right to do it. Yeah. So if they don't have enough data for an area, they'll do one of the normal vowels. But if they have enough data for recent sales in that area, they, at their choice, may elect to do desktop vowels. Does that make sense? Now, here's my question to you. Knowing some of this, um, ignore the construction bit at the moment, knowing some of this, how can you optimise that process? So you should be asking yourself, so what? How does this make me money? Correct? Yep. All right. Well, would you like an example? Yes. All right. So one of the things I did was um, when I was refinancing, I knew about this with CBA. I'm not suggesting you use CBA or not use CBA. Right? But their data showed that... Um, because there's a property in Hawthorne that I refinanced through them, their data showed that two bettors in Hawthorne were more expensive or valued higher than my two better. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? Because, uh, I, look, I don't know why, but um, they just had higher price multiples than I did. Now, I found that out. Why? Because I had a very strong relationship with my business banker. Right? And I said, cause I, but you see, I knew to ask the question first. I said, which areas can I get desktop vowels on, right, out of the properties I was refinancing? He told me. I said, what does the price come up at for each of these, for these types of properties? He told me. And I said, I'll bring the loan across, but I want those desktop vowels for these ones and these others, which are in Queensland and other places. I said, I want to be able to do the vowel. And he went, as a whole size of a deal, he went, sure, no problem. Now, what do you think the end result of that was by getting vowels a, I didn't have to pay such a high price for them. B, I got them done faster because a desktop vowel is much faster than a human vowel. But what do you think the, the real big benefit was of getting a desktop vowel done? More gap, which means what? Less of my money in the deal, correct? Which leaves me more money for the next deal or doing other things, correct? It gives me a higher internal rate of return. So everything you, be, you should be learning, you should be asking that question. So what? How do I make money out of this? Okay. Now, construction vowels. A construction vowel. This is done only by senior valuers. And what they'll do is this is um, an end, this is a realization vowel. Right? But you want to know that if I've got this block of land and I've got these plans and I get this thing built, what is the end value of the entire development? That's the question you want to find out. Does everybody understand that? These vowels are very detailed. They can easily run into, you know, 40, 50, 60 pages, right? They will cost anywhere from three to five thousand, sorry, anywhere from three to up to $15,000. Sometimes even more than that, depending on how big the development is, because you see, whenever they do a vowel, do you remember what I said to you about what vowels have on them, the bottom of them? They have a professional indemnity clause, right? Why? Because if whoever is relying on that vowel, which could be a lender lending money to the development, if that doesn't go, if it doesn't, um, if it actually gets sold and they lose more than 10%, anything beyond that, they can sue who? The, the, the valuer and the, actually their professional indemnity insurance policy, right? So that's why, because it's a bigger development, the insurance premium is higher, every vowel has got an insurance premium built into it. Does that make sense? Okay. So, so what? How does that make me money? 
Right, good. Because you, you had lunch and you're probably a little bit, you know. <laughs> All right. So if I was doing a negotiation with a developer to do a whole line takeout, right, guess what? They would have already had to pay for that valuation, correct? Yep. They would have already gone to a lender and that lender would have said, because generally what happens is they will actually pay this money, but the lender will usually control the val, just like as in normal, because the, because the lender doesn't want to be ripped off. They want to know that it's a legitimate val and that they've instructed the valuer. Does everyone understand that? Now, that valuation is usually only made out to the, to the lender and often it's made out to the, the um, developer because they get a copy of it. may or may not be made out to them, but at least they get a copy of it. They've already paid for this. What do you think is in there? Lots of brilliant info done by a senior valuer who's probably spent maybe a month researching all of this or at least several weeks. Now... Do you think it's going to have lots and lots of comparable information about other properties and other deals, in other developments around there? Yes or no? Yes. Right? Do you think that that may be useful information to you? Yes or no? Yes. Of course it is. So what you could do with that valuation is you can see, well, which properties are superior, which ones are inferior. You could even use that from a negotiation point of view, but you can even use it as to when your property goes to end valuation and gets completed, those other buildings, you've already just saved yourself 90% of the time because now you look for the comparable sales in those other properties. Does that make sense? So you, have, you haven't had to pay for this. It's an extensive document. They will not volunteer this, but could this be part of your negotiation? All right, if we take out the whole development, we want to see your construction vow. Because that is done by an independent um, person who's a professional, and that'll give you so much information about the development. We'll even give you comments in terms of what they think about the quality, the comparable qualities, all of those. And could you glean lots of information from that that could be useful in your negotiation? Yes or no? Absolutely. All right? So it's important to understand each of these. I'll tell you, this is hard to get. It's not impossible, but it's just harder to get. Now, where is it easier to get? Let's think about this. If you, as an example, decide to do a, um, a joint venture with a developer, right, because you've already met the developer, you've bought a whole bunch off them, the next time you approach them as part of your syndicate and say, we, we got a great result last time, what we'd like to do now is we'd like you to, to build just on our behalf, right, and we'll get you 100% pre-sales so you can get the finance. And you, could you negotiate up front that you get a copy of that vow. Yep. That's part of your negotiation. All right? So you can do things like that now that you're aware of them. But if you're not even aware that it exists, how do you ask for it? Does everybody follow? Yep. So prior to um, getting the uh, settlement, and I'm not going to cover some of this because remember at the two-day event, I said, what do you have to do? You have to get a value off whose panel? The lender's panel. How do you find out who's on the lender's panel? There's a couple of ways. Number one, you ask the lender. Number two, you ask a broker. Number three, you ring the valuers and you ask. What are the questions you ask? Whose panel are you on? Right? You want to ask, what areas do you do? You want to ask, what type of properties do you do? Remember those three key things? Okay. Now, do you pick a value that's only used by one bank? or a value that's used by 20 banks? 20, why? You can make it assignable, that's right. So you've only paid for the valuation once. You can then, if, if it doesn't go ahead with that bank, you don't have to pay for another one, you put it to another bank. What was the other reason why I said, really important reason that you use a value, a widely used valuer? More opportunity to get finance. More opportunity, but there's, you're getting close, but that's not the reason. Another reason? Thank you. Who said that? Play them off against each other. It's part of your negotiation. Remember I said in the example that you might go to NAB and you've got it assigned to Westpac and you've given the finance submission, you go, whoops, sorry, wrong one. I'm seeing them an hour later, but obviously I've got a relationship with you guys. I prefer to do it with you. But you know what? To me, it's whoever does the right deal first. Remember that? Because you have to have a reason why, a legitimate, logical, smart reason that they'll accept why you got one of their valuers. Well, because I've got, I'm busy. There's so many things I want to do. Um, rather than just using one valuer with this bank and then it not going through, getting another value with another bank, I'd rather save some money. I'd rather speed up the process. I'd rather I'd ra use one that's widely used and widely um, held uh, in high esteem by all the banks. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. 
Now, what, what do you say to them when they say, well, sorry, Mr. Molnar, we, um, we don't accept valuations? Remember we said? Well, I happen to use the same one that you guys use. They're already on your panel, right? What if they say, okay, well, we still can't accept it because it's not formatted correctly? What do we say then? I've made sure that the value has added exactly the same formatting, the same um, in clauses that they would normally do for you every single day of the week. Remember we said that? Good. Don't have to go over it again. So four months prior to settlement, that's when you should start doing extensive due diligence to the market. Search properties which are similar to yours in quality and position but are priced significantly higher. Why is it, is it possible that two properties that look similar, same finishes, you know, they're both two bedders, they're in the same type of quality development, why are they a different price? Well, there could be a range of reasons. And some of these reasons are the reasons that you will give to your valuer to help sway them one way or another. Does that make sense? Whether to say why yours is superior and to say why others are inferior. Okay? Such as developers' construction costs are higher. You may find that um, um, a developer using commercial construction methods right, may have a different price base than someone using residential construction methods, right, just because they're more complicated. Often, if you've got a slightly larger development, it may fall into unionised labour, and th therefore it may actually be more expensive than someone who's just a small family builder. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, land costs are higher. Someone may have just gotten a really good deal, another person may have got ripped off. Some other person who bought a block of land expecting to put so-and-so on it and work out their site cost or, or their cost per site realised that they couldn't get through council what they expected, they couldn't get the permits and have to put a lot lower density on there and therefore um, their, their, their per site cost has gone up dramatically. Now it was interesting listening to Victor about the height restrictions out at Doncaster because a good friend of mine is a developer out at uh, Liverpool in Sydney's southwest. Does anyone know where that is, Liverpool? Oh, New South Wales people would. Um, he got in and Liverpool Council has put a maximum height restriction on in that sort of, it's not, I won't call it exactly a CBD, but, you know, close to the main shops, etc. He was one of the last to get through with the heights that he's at. No one else in the future will be able to get in at his height. What has that suddenly done to his site? Well, it makes it much more valuable because anyone who builds from now on will still have to pay the same land cost, but they won't have as high as a gross realisation. Does that make sense? So it suddenly made his land and what his permits on that land much, much more valuable. Make sense? Okay. Um, there are some developers that want more profit margin. You may find that some developers are often a large syndicate and everybody wants a decent cut of the pie. So they're saying, no, no, we want this price point. Whereas some other developers who are just by themselves, who are just they just want to turn over stock and they maybe want to just keep their building arm employed, they're happier to work off a lower margin. Developer purchased the land recently, still selling off the plan. They've got holding costs. Developer's construction method is not as efficient. Finishes are similar to yours but are more expensive because of the carelessness of the architect. This is actually an interesting point. Some architects, um, sometimes they do monuments to themselves, right? just simply because it's their brand name, they bank off their next brand name, but they may build or design things that are so intricate. I've actually seen poor builders go, how the heck do we do this? Right? Whereas, you know, they could have made it just a little bit less complex, still gotten maybe 80% of the impact of it, but made it su su sufficiently simpler to build and construct and brought the prices way down. Does that make sense? All right? I've seen um, uh, an architect design something that would have worn out in six months, got would have been, as a floor surface, would have been scratched and had to be completely replaced every six months. That's just not smart, is it? All right? But it looked sensational. All right? All right, you need to research both the sale and rental price obtained in similar properties, create a, a research journal for each property. Um, that due diligence kit that some of you have received and we're going to re-email to all of you is a great starting point. Have the property revalued using a widely used bank value. You need to sell it to them. I've been through all that and you need to explain your point of view. If the property is worth 15% more at settlement than the original retail price, it makes a huge difference. Here's an example. Remember, you want to create gap. The higher the prices you can get, the more you can make them accept your point of view, right? The less money you need to put in, the sooner you can get onto the first one or the subsequent ones or the more buffer you can have left over in case the inevitable happens and you have problems. Everybody understand that? Yes? 
Fantastic. Okay, now, um, you need to write these numbers down. A valuer is usually instructed by a bank to find comp sales that are within the last 12 weeks and usually not more than six months. But most importantly, they have to be settled. Settled. Settled sales. Here's my question to you. Is it possible for something to exchange and something happens in the meantime and the property doesn't settle? Does that, has that ever happened in the history of property? <laughs> happens lots. So it actually isn't a real sale. It does not end up going to the public record. And in fact, it may then resell on the market at a fire sale price, which is now lower. Who understands that? Now, if that's the case, it has now set a new lower price point for a comparable sale in that market, correct? Yep. All right. And it actually becomes very difficult for the value of them because they can't justify it as a real sale anymore. So they all have issues with their professional indemnity insurance. So... They will always look preferably at settled sales, but given the time frames the banks want, they want sales in the last 12 weeks. Why? Because is the market, particularly here in Melbourne, shifting dramatically? Anything older than 12 weeks, anything older than three months is way too old. There are some suburbs, Malvern's probably the example I remember, um, in Malvern you've got property prices growing between 97 and 98% on average in the last year. Three months means 25% difference. On a $400,000 property, that's $100,000 worth of difference. Do you think valuers would be in trouble if they're $100,000 out, yes or no? Of course they would be. So sometimes valuers are actually stuck between a rock and, um, and a hard surface. As um, it was on TV last night, this, uh, I won't say who said it, but uh, he was a leader of an um, um, Asian country. Anyway, um, this actually makes it very difficult for them because sometimes to find enough relevant sales of that type of property, they have to look for sales that are actually not settled. Does that make sense? And it's not a, it's not a good position. They like depth of the market. They like where there's lots of properties that help support their point of view, but in some cases they have no choice. Make sense? Now, something else you need to know is valuers, when they go through and look at a property, um, they actually ignore the day-to-day -day mess. Real estate agents and buyers do not, but valuers have been specifically trained to ignore any day-to-day -day mess. However, there is one situation where they don't, and you need to know this. When a property is mortgagee in possession, right, and it's about to be fire sailed, then they'll look at it the way it is. Why? Because generally properties that are mortgagee in possession won't have had any money spent on, on the repairs and the running maintenance. Does that make sense? So those properties are generally marked down in terms of a valuation point of view and in many cases they will sell at that auction price and that will be reflected in that auction because it's a fire sale price. Just bear in mind that getting a lower val on something that's about to be fire sale, if they know it's mortgagee in possession and you bail it out beforehand, you may actually end up with a lower valuation until you go in and you renovate it. If they know it's a mortgagee in possession, just be careful that they actually may value it down because it was sold as mortgagee in possession. That means that it hasn't been looked after, the maintenance is poor, etc., etc. Does that make sense? So, so bear that in mind that if it's a mortgagee in possession property, you may actually have to kick in more equity. Your internal rate of return actually may be lower because of the shaved vowels that they generally do. All right? But it may not be a big problem because once you settle it, you may be able to revalue it after doing a quick cosmetic reno after about a month and get the value back up to the normal market vowel and then pull out any money. Make sense? Um, one of the other things I thought I'd throw in there because we're actually talking a lot about... Um, off the plan, etc. Oh, sorry, can I go to um, slideshow things? Yep. I also threw this in, and I suggest you may want to write this down. I put this in last night. Um, uh, to be erected valuations, documents required are the building contract, the building specification, the building plans, 
And if land is part of the purchase, such as a house and land, they're going to want to see the contract of sale. And why will they look at the contract of sale? Because they want to see if there's any rebate clauses or anything like that. Um, and the title and plan of subdivision. Why do, they, why do you think a value will insist on seeing the title and plan of subdivision? They want to know the physical area, absolutely. There's something else they want to know. There's two other things. Thank you. The, who said that? Legal description. Thanks, Will. Right, so is it, com uh, is it company title? Is it strata title? Is it Torrens title? And actually, before we're actually having this conversation, before Torrens title, and I don't know about every single state, but in New South Wales, um, there used to be a, a chain title. It's a very, it's, it's usually called the old form of title. And just about when any property in New South Wales is sold, it has the old form of title. What they immediately do, the solicitors have to convert it into a Torrens title. You'll you'll never know about that, but it's something that happens automatically in the background. Okay, but there's one other reason why they have to check the plan of uh, the title and plan of subdivision. So legal description, physical size. Easement. Thank you, easements. Because is an easement going to have an effect? A water or gas or a right of way or carriageway, is that going to have an effect on that property? Yes or no? Your ability to do further developments on that or to extend, it's going to have a big um, impact on its valuation. They'll also check the zoning, which will be part of that as well. Now, just to recap a couple of things. Um, when you're doing a valuation, it is good to have a senior valuer, not a junior valuer, because they're so constrained by making sure that they've done the right thing. And valuers... Sorry, can I just go to flip charts? Oh, has everyone written that down? No? Okay, stay on slideshow for a second. Why do you want to slideshow things? Why do you want to stay um, with a senior valuer? Well, senior valuers are used to doing these um, NVALs. They're used to doing these realisation valuations for developments. So they're used to negotiations with vendors. They're used to that. So if you're doing a valuation on your property or if you're doing a valuation as part of a syndicate on a number of properties, you want to try to target. Remember I said, so what? How does that make me money? Remember? All right. So if you're part of a syndicate and you want a valuation, right, when you've got a larger group um, and you need vowels on, on a whole development or individual units within a development, you want to see if you can get a senior valuer, particularly someone who does development valuations. Why? Because that person is much more used to negotiation and they're usually senior enough in that organisation so that what they say goes. Does that make sense? Whereas a junior person is not. I mean, valuers study for four years, they're like a probationary valuer, and then after two years they actually generally have to present a number of valuations that get peer audited before they become full members of the Australian Property Institute. It's a very arduous process they, the poor buggers have to go through, right? But remember, we also said there's a difference between evaluation and appraisal. Who remembers the differences? Appraisal is done by who? Real estate agent. Valuations are done by valuers. Appraisals are usually in a number range, so 400 to 450. Valuations are a specific price. Can you have more than one specific price from, a val from different valuers? Yes or no? Which one is the legally correct price? Both. Great. Which one should you pick? Probably the higher one. All right. It's your choice. All right. Um, okay, guys, I just wanted to mention one more quick thing about valuations. Valuers are generally very familiar with an area. Can I get a flip charts, please? So part of the other thing that they'll take into account is, in terms of the risks, is... Um, the surroundings, e.g. forest. So you actually may have a property up in the Dandenongs that's surrounded by bushland and you've got a weatherboard house. Do you think they'd give you the same valuation on that property if it wasn't surrounded by trees as it was surrounded by trees? All right. So that's another um, item they take into account. One of the other reasons they also do a lot of background checks before giving evaluation in terms of the title, easements and all those sorts of things is there is a, um, I was talking to a valuer just the other day about this and over in Coburg, and some of you may have actually heard about this, there is a um, 
apartment development, small apartment development, residential apartment development. And it's been built for a while, no one lives there. No one lives there. Do you know which one I'm talking about? The, the one next door to um, the, uh, the dry cleaning place. Which the, and this is why making sure you do all your, te- your checks are really important, because the valuers found something, right, that the builder didn't know, didn't know that the land was contaminated, right? Actually, I think there were people living there for a short period of time. They kept complaining about the fumes. But basically, in the dry cleaning process, you use a huge range of chemicals. The land next door was polluted. They went ahead and built. Things got to be torn down now. What do you think that does to valuations? Yeah, it's over in Coburg. I actually don't remember the address. One of the other things I actually wanted to mention here is... um, it was, I think Rob mentioned this or Frank mentioned, I think it was Frank who mentioned it. Um, one of the key things that you need to do when you're doing your own um, valuation before you put together the information about buying a property and you pass on to a valuer. Um, so this is the steps well, well before you even get to this because you need to assess these risks. Would you agree? One of the things that I didn't know about Melbourne, which I feel kind of dumb not knowing, but um, it's flatter than Sydney. And I didn't ask myself, so what? What does that mean? I feel so embarrassed. But I'm going to tell you because you're learning from some of the mistakes I've made and you're learning from the cumulative experience of all of our speakers. And by the way, we had some awesome speakers so far. All right. Um, Now, one of the things I didn't realise is Melbourne is relatively flat. And so Melbourne has an enormous number of level crossings. You don't get that in Sydney. Like you might get... Like, I know there's one out near Parramatta, but that's kind of the only one that springs to mind, right, that's in a busy metropolitan area. They're all over Melbourne. And there's this funny rule in Melbourne. Any time a train goes through there, they toot. (laughs) Now you think, yes, so what? Well, if you live next to the main rail line that, hang on, that does all of the freight movements which happen in the middle of the night, right? And I didn't realise this. And so I actually moved into a place in the western suburbs that was close to the airport and close to the city that gave me really fast access. Beautiful renovated four-bedroom house, but I moved in just before Christmas. Most businesses had shut down. I, I, and it was kind of my fault because I was so busy I didn't have time to move and like the first house I said yeah that'll do fine right and I just moved in threw everything in and then the next day I moved uh, I went back up to Sydney for Christmas right um, but after I came back in sort of you know mid-January etc I started to notice it's getting noisy in, on this street because I didn't realize that all the um the it was a main thoroughfare for all the trucks etc for all the businesses around the area which had already shut down Right, But then I didn't realise something else, that in the middle of the night when you expect it to be quiet, right, you hear all these doot-doot and you hear, and freight trains are long. <laughs> and there's just this enormous amount of noise. Now, luckily I sleep like a log, but it's just getting to sleep. Or if, or if you've had a big night and, the, and when the wall stops spinning, you know, then you're trying to fall asleep. It's still a bit hard with all this background noise, but things like this, uh, this is what Frank said, go when the area is quiet. I remember um, I went to visit where my sister lives, and um, the, this, uh, she lives in some townhouses, and a new person moved in across the driveway, and I was just having a bit of a, a yak with him, and he goes, you know, um, it's actually noisier than what I thought. It's hard to get to sleep. And I go, oh yeah, that would be because... Um, you're, you're on one of the three stories, and these are all the two stories, right? And the freeway's up there. Well, all the noise, as it comes down, it hits the roof line and either goes into the, the creek and the paddock for the two-story ones, but for the three-story ones, it just goes straight over the top and probably gets bounced up and into their apartments where they, where they sleep. And he goes, great. <laughs> and anyway, uh, he's moving out because he just can't stand the level of noise. But it's that constant background noise that's coming down from the freeway because the freeway is just used all the time. So part of um, before you determine something, you need to do all of this research. Now, so what? What does that mean? How does it make me money? 
How does it make you money? Could you use this as part of your negotiation? Because do the people currently living there know things such as it's noisy at night or there's all these trucks that use this as the main route or that there's a train line that's the main freight line between Sydney and Melbourne and it's the main marshalling yard for all the trains with all their... Oh, God, it was noisy. Right? And in the middle... Like during the day, you wouldn't hear it. But in the middle of the night when it's quiet, there's no buses or trucks or, or dogs or kids yet running around and the church is closed, you know, you just... Don't hear anything except for all this background noise, okay? So that's what it means to you is you can actually use this as a, um, a bargaining chip for you, trying to get a better price or getting better terms or getting something special like prior access. Does that make sense? John, you were hi. talking about two types of... Oh, sorry, you went back through four or five types of valuations. Yep. Uh, shh, I, guys, shh, shh. Yep. And I'd actually arranged for some valuations of our properties, and I'd, the, the valuer asked if I wanted a short form for refinancing, which is basically what I wanted it for, or yep. a longer version, which would go into great detail. Would it have cost me any more to have gone for the longer version? Okay, fantastic question. Thank you, John. Um, normally, banks only require a short form val, right? However... Um, long form vows are generally required for the, the courts, particularly the family court. So um, they're often done for estate disputes, for divorces, for wills. There's a whole range of reasons why long form vows are done, right? But the short form vow, all a bank needs is a short form vow because they just basically need a price and indemnity. Right? And they're happy enough with that because there's either explicit or implicit instructions to them to be a little bit on the conservative side, which I'm sure everyone's experienced. Okay? okay and, Sorry? From my perspective, uh, it would have cost you more than... Okay, from John's perspective, absolutely. It would have cost you more for a full report because there's just more work involved with it. It generally... You know what's really in there is lots more comparable sales information. All right? So it's just more of their time. Okay? Steve, with the rent multiples that you work out your commercial val on, is there yep. a formula that you can apply for that? I mean, what do yeah, you multiply um, by what? Look, okay, I'm, I'm going to give you a very simplistic view of the rent multiple, um, but I'm going to show you why it varies and can vary substantially. Okay? So in terms of rent multiples, um, and off, honestly, I don't go into a lot of details on this because this is a commercial strategy. Um, and then eventually, if there's enough demand, we'll release a commercial program. Because I'll teach you lots and lots and lots about commercial property, right? If people want that eventually down the track. But it's not part of what we're doing right now. But in terms of rent multiples, let's say you've got a property that rents for um, $400, $400 per week. And it's in an area um, that's giving about 5% per annum yield, Right? that would value that asset at about $400,000 or thereabouts. Does that make sense? Hello? Yep? Yeah. Okay. Now, let's say, for instance, in that same area, you managed to get um, a property that was maybe a, like a little bit bigger, marginally bigger, or in a better location or something like that, and it rented for $500 per week. What would that now be worth? Given it's the same area, the same yield, what would it be worth? 500000 now, I'm dumbing this down quite substantially because it's a gross oversimplification. But does that make sense in terms of understanding the rent multiples? Now, let me tell you where it changes. Often, the smaller the property that you go into, right, the more valuable it is and, and the higher the rental that you get on it. So, for instance, Coles, when they take out a whole shopping centre area for a supermarket their dollars per square metre is substantially lower. So at one end of the spectrum, you might have coals and they pay very, very little. Do you want to know what's at the other extreme end of the spectrum? What did you say? So there's something much smaller that is actually at much more extreme end. ATM. The ATM is at virtually the other extreme end of the dollars per square metre end. So at one end, you've got an ATM... Right At the very far end, you've got the very large Woolworths, Safeways or Coles of the world. Right now, now, it gets even more complicated because it depends on the covenants or the power and the strength of that, um, that leasee. So, for instance, um, a property may rent for less dollars 
to someone who is a, um, a client that could be relied upon, such as a bank, versus a bookshop selling books for $2. Does that make sense? Right? So even though the, the bookshop rents the physical same premises, right, but because their brand isn't as strong or, you know, their ability to, you know, the likelihood of them renewing and paying on time and if they had to sue them getting their money is very low, whereas with a bank it's very high. So a bank, you might actually have a lower um, price but it, but, um, than the bookshop, but it still could be worth more renting it to the bank, right? Does that make sense? Now, there's another level on top of that, right? Because there's always another level, isn't there? Right? And this comes back to marquee clients or foundation clients. So in a shopping centre, what you tend to have is you have these anchor clients or anchor tenancies, such as the Coles and Woolworths uh, or a Kmart or something like that, which they know will draw people in, right? So by drawing them in, they will offer them as a loss leader lower dollars per square metre, sometimes half or quarter, sometimes 10% of what other smaller shops are offering. A friend of mine used to be a very senior guy at Westfield, and he was explaining to me exactly how they cut and dice the space and they make the most amount of money. Did you know in a shopping centre, they have people who work out people dynamics in terms of where they walk? You ever notice why there's escalators here, but to get to the next floor, you've got to walk past all these freaking shops to get to the next floor? Ever notice that? That's because what they do is they're, they're churning more traffic around their shopping centre. It's easy to get in, but to get out is incredibly difficult of a shopping centre, isn't it? Same way um, um, casinos are built and designed, by the way. Um, and that's why there's no windows, because they want you to know, they want you to lose sense of a track of, they want you to lose the sense time, lose track of time, that's the word, yeah, right? Um, but what they also do is, so um, you've got the, the marquee or foundational anchor tenants, they'll charge them a lot less because they know that tenancy, that brand name, because of all the advertising they do, will draw in all of these other people. So that's another variation. But then there comes another variation, right? Um, and that variation is, well, how long have they signed that lease for? And like, is it a five by five by five? You know. Are they paying all the outgoings? Um, then you've got other variations, such as, well, did they do a whole fit-out? And does the fit-out for a dollar become the property of the new owner? Or do they have to fit it back to where it was? Because often, commercial properties are just a shell. There's nothing there. You, as the tenancy, put everything in. And that could actually be a lot of dollars. Does that all make sense? I'm not trying to get out of your question. I'm trying to explain to you that there's so many levels of commercial valuation. The basis starts with these rent multiples. But as you can appreciate, it's very complex. I'll give you actually an even further complication, right? Because there's always another level, isn't there? Do you know in a shopping centre where you've got shops on this side, shops on this side, and they sometimes put a little booth in the middle? They are sometimes the most expensive. Why? Because they get two sets of traffic walking past them. They are some of the most expensive spaces in a whole shopping centre because they're small and because they got traffic that is judged to be walking. They actually, they judge them to have up to twice as much traffic walking past them. Okay, uh, are you happy with that answer? <laughs> Very long-winded, but happy? Good. Okay, next question, please. Yes, can you just tell me the difference between the realisation value and the to be erected value? Okay, to be erected is maybe just a single property, right? But the realisation is usually done for a construction value is a much bigger development. D does that make sense? So they're looking maybe in two, three years down the track, all of these, if they get built, what's it likely to be worth in that market? Construction is just for... Usually, it's, it's usually meant for a much shorter time frame. It's only that last one is really that, that I had up there was meant for the big developments. All the others were, were variations of an existing house or existing apartment or existing townhouse or, or, or an apartment house or townhouse to be built. D does that make sense? Okay. Next question. Yeah, just a quick one, Steve. Um, yeah. How long is evaluation good for? Oh, um, valuations, I think they're only good for about a month. You need to check um, with the valuation firm, but it's not a very long time. Um, now, if you need it beyond that, what they'll do, and it's not a very difficult thing, um, if the market hasn't changed um, substantially and they know that it's still physically built, so it hasn't burnt down or anything, they can just use the same vowel and just refresh it. 
and that usually is only a small cost. Three months. Okay, there you go. Yeah, it's it's relatively a well, it's relatively a short period of time. I thought I know some of them may have gone a bit longer, but I'd rather be a little bit safer. But yeah, one to three months. Um, I know I've had one that said it's only valid for a month. So you know, it's whatever they say to you, but it's not valid for like a year or two or something like that because the market just changes too quickly. And it's 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 not so much them; it's actually their professional indemnity insurance that dictates that. When you are accessing or trying to get a valuation for an off the plan. It's not built yet. Is there any sort of way of determining as there's various developers with sites for sale, so then they put up signs, 50% sold, 30% sold. Is there any way of determining what those sold units did sell for? Is there a register? Because it's really private to the development company, isn't it? So, And they, maybe they're not going to do settlement for some time. So do they remain private and unknown? You've just got to go on past sales? Okay, um, that's a complicated question, but l let me explain the process. No, no, it's, it's fine. It's a great question. Um, generally, when you see these developments, say, 50 to 70% sold, um, what what was that? Is that a light? Oh, okay. Um, Simon, can you get that fixed somehow? <laughs> I just noticed it was darker, that's all. Oh, I've had that at one... <laughs> Oh, but don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mean to upset you, but I'm going to stand over here for the rest of the event. <laughs> okay? All right? No problem. All right. Um, now, uh, the question was, often when you get these that are 50, 70 percent sold, they haven't entered the public record, right? Um, Value is, though, generally have a very strong relationship with real estate agents because real estate agents know that value is ultimately there to help them because the more sales that happen in that area, so the more open they are with them, the more they're there to help. They're not there to compete with them, so there's usually no problem. In fact, in, in many um, municipal councils, valuers can just walk in and, you know, if they're a member of the Australian Property Institute, etc., they can just look at any um, property values. The only problem with, in some jurisdictions, is they're based on land values, so depending how they're assessed, and sometimes they actually haven't been done for a long period of time. But mostly, they'll ring up agents that they have a good relationship with in that area, and the agent will have no problem telling them what the price they sold for. So that's one part of the answer, but there's another level to that answer, right? Um, sometimes... Um, what agents will do is they'll actually have rebate clauses, etc., built into that. And um, a valuer, if they actually saw the contract, may devalue it as part of that. So as an example, if there's a $400,000 property with a $50,000 rebate, um, the net price is only three fifty. dollars If they saw that, a bank and a valuer would only say it's worth three fifty. dollars so because it hasn't entered the public record and because they probably don't get a chance to physically inspect the contracts themselves um, and the... If they tell them the price, they may only say 400000 so that could be a bit misleading. Plus, those sales have not actually settled yet, right? So again, it's not the best indication. It's better than nothing, but it's still not the best indication, right? Now, another part of that answer is, could you start the process yourself beforehand to say, look, I'm interested in buying in this, but what I'd like to see is I want to see the, the contracts of sale myself, so not as a value, but as you independently, as part of your research you do, before you even get to the stage of paying a value to go out and do this for you. Now, if they won't, I'd be asking, well, why won't you? If they say, oh, privacy, you know, grab the pack of post notes, say, no problem. I don't want to see the names. I don't need to know their names. I just need to see that they've been signed, dated, and the price. Right? So that's what I would be doing before I got to the stage of getting a value to come in. Then what a value is more likely to do is that he'll, he or she will look at developments in the area that have probably settled, but they may actually take into account other developments and look at it from a dollars per square metre basis, right? And then, based on that, work out what it should be worth, right? Now, I'll, t I'll tell you one of the pitfalls, because that was your next question, wasn't it? <laughs> right? All right, the pitfall is, um, and this is why you must see the valuation, and this is why you must tell the value that you, you want to check their valuation just to see that they haven't done something quick and easy, such as getting a price list from that developer. And I, this happened to me once, and let me tell you, I was a little bit upset. And all they did was they listed properties that were on the price list of the developer. And I went, well, that's useless. They, just, they, they literally rang the developer who faxed them a price list, Right, of property still available, not even exchanged. And they just used those as their references. And I went, that's bull. 
rust. <laughs> you know, it just, that just wasn't going to cut it for me because that's not real enough for me. Because I would also have a lot of trouble in relying off anything like that um, to make a decision and then ultimately um, to get comparable sales. See, before I actually buy something, I want to know that there are properties that I can at worst case refer back to that have sold at, in the secondary market, preferably at arm's length, that I can use to chase up and find references to get my valuation as high as possible. Does that fully answer that question? Terrific. Okay. Hi, Steve. Hi. Um, what would be the proper approach, actually? Because I asked my, my, my banker, because I got an L, existing LOC, and I said, um, can we have uh, to increase my borrowing capacity as for valuation? But the banker told me, he said, um, well, you need to uh, fill a form first and ask how much you want to borrow your LOC. So I was thinking, which one goes first, actually, the valuation or your application to raise the LOC? Okay. There's actually a more complicated question than what um, most people may consider. Because, can I go to, oh, we're on flip charts. You may actually have a property that's worth this much, right? You may already have an existing val worth this much. But for some reason, you only put your LOC to this point, correct? So you may have an existing val that you haven't actually put your LOC to the full value of. And I'm not giving you advice because I'm not allowed to, but this is what sometimes happens. People have a VAL and they only have a, a smaller line of credit because this could be your home loan, as an example, and you have a line of credit for $50,000, not to the full valuation of the property. Why do you think that may be a smart strategy to do? Think about human nature. So you don't spend it all. So you're limiting yourself to not do massive damage to yourself. So you may actually only have your line of credit to here. So if your VAL is already registered and in the system up to here, it, it may be a very simple matter to put in another application because what they'll do is they'll check your serviceability, all of that, and then institute it up to the top of the VAL. Does that make sense? However, what's most likely the case is your LOC is to the full value of your, your valuation. Well, as, as, as um, what you need to do is get it revaled if the valuation is higher than the old val, you take it to your bank. If it's not, what do you do with it? File it in the bin, right? So you'll take that to your bank and you'll say, this is what it's worth, right? You have it assigned to them, you have it formatted in a way that they'll, they'll accept, and then you, you raise your line of credit to whatever you can. Remember, a val, it, it's, this isn't technically 100% right because really a val will be to, you know, let's say um, 400K, sorry, to 500K, but the bank will only lend you, you know, to 400K, right? So I'm just assuming that the val and the price are the same. So, but all you've got to do is get a new valuation, raise it up, and the bank will lend you 80 to 90%, whatever that figure is, and then your line of credit, you'll raise up to that. You're not, you may have to pay a little bit in fees to do that, but um, you won't be paying any more interest because unless you borrow more money out, you don't pay interest. You only pay interest on what you've borrowed. Does that make sense? Okay. Does that answer that? Well, look, it's a smart thing to revalue uh, on a regular basis anyway. And there's another reason why you should revalue on a regular basis, not just because you need the practice, <laughs> right? Because remember I said yesterday, someone's using your money. It may as well be you. Remember I, I explained to you why? But there's actually another reason as well. What's the other reason? Well, if, if you've got a property worth 300K, putting it up to maybe 350K, then 400K, then 450K is not a big jump. But going from three to 400K may be a very big jump. And the bank, you know, they may not be 100% comfortable with that. And they might say, oh, well, they've already got plenty of equity. We'll just make it up to 380 or 390, not quite to 400. Does that make sense? So it's actually a really smart move to, on a regular basis, gets you into practice, becomes habit forming. Habit forming is good, right? You're doing it on a regular basis, right? Because imagine this, the time that you need it, the time when, when see, the banks always want to give you money at the times when you don't want it or don't need it. But when you do need it, then they won't give it to you. If you understand that principle, what you do is you make hay while the sun shines and you keep ramping it up, ramping it up, ramping it up. You don't use it, you stay disciplined, you just ramp it up. Because a line of credit is a pre-approved 
ongoing credit facility. It's a revolving line of credit, right? So you don't need to get an approval every time. So if your circumstances change, you know, obviously you should be telling the bank if you lost your job and you're out of work or you've decided to retire from the workforce forever, you should be telling them. But do people's financials change on a regular basis, you know, a little bit up and down? Well, you don't want it to happen at the time when you're a little bit down and you need the money. You don't want that to happen then, correct? That's why you need to be always getting it as high as possible, whether or not you use it, but stay disciplined. Okay. Next up, the, where are we? Who's got the mic? Uh, yeah, it's, what documentation would you need? This is to, to maybe, I don't know if this is a feasible thing to do, but just to get a, a little check on um, uh, property values, to get a desktop valuation, how much documentation do you need to go to the bank to get that? And does it go very far into their files and is it written down against your name anyway? Or? Okay, desktop vows you can only do, as far as I know, through CBA. There may be some other banks doing it because they're a very large bank. They have lots and lots of data to base this off, right? But you don't get to pick. They get to pick whether or not they'll choose to go down there. And one of the reasons they'll only go down that path is they have enough data to support you know, a, a large enough sample size of that type of property in that suburb that's recent enough for them to decide, you know what, we have a pretty good idea what property of that type is worth in that area. But you don't get to pick normally. They get to make that decision. Okay? Question? Yep, just here. Um, yeah, we've been basically following that sort of strategy and what accountants advice to try and max their line of credit as much as the bank will give us, grab as much as you can. That's great. Um, the negative for us is we're probably with the one bank and it's all cross-collateralised. If we actually refinance with another lender to try and get it out of the grasps of the one bank, is there any way they can call up or amend or change the line of credit that we've established? Um, okay. I'm, I'm actually going to talk about finance a little bit later on, cool. so I'd rather not talk about it now. If that's right? Great. That's module six, I think, which is two modules along. I'll talk lots about finance. I love finance. Hi, Steve. Hi. Um, I just wanted to um, just ask, um, as a beginner who, who's never done any of this, are we going to be practising this over the next 12 months as part yeah, of Yeah, absolutely. The I'm going to make you do stuff in assignments for every part of this process. Yeah, getting valuations. Getting vows. Um, you know, if you've already got a home, get a, you know, put together all the due diligence and then talk to a valuer and get a valuation done. Um, we're going to get to, you to do... Um, you know, a, a potentially refinance, whether or not you go ahead with this or not, but put together your A&Ls, your P&Ls, do a finance submission, all of those sorts of things. Do um, the, um, the cash flows on a property, all of those sorts of things I'm going to get you to do. That's part of what we're going to force you to do to help yourself to learn this so that you've learned it forever and you can use it as often and as fast as slow as you want to. Even if I don't have a property at the yeah. moment? Because yes, even if you, before you've bought a property, can you put together a due diligence kit on a property, yes or no? Yeah. Right? Could you even get a valuation done on a property that you're thinking of buying, yeah. even though you don't own it yet? Yeah. Of course you can. And could you do this in a syndicate of maybe a couple of friends and do the exercise together and so split the costs of a valuation? Yeah. Right? They cost between three and 500 bucks, but see, there's many ways of achieving the same outcome. That's what we're going to help you do. Okay, great. Thanks. No problem. Oh, where's Hi. Thomas? Um, oh. If we get a valuation through the bank done for us, then it's much lower than the um, valuation that we expected significantly. How do we get the bank to accept our valuation? Uh, okay. In did you come to my two-day event? Yes, I did. Okay. <laughs> because what did I say I at the two-day event? I did. I do did not listen. allow the banks to do the valuation. Right? You control the valuation, you get the val assigned to them from their bank panel lenders and you give it to them. You just said the bank's valuation came in lower. You just let them do the val. They don't, they don't normally go out and do the val unless you've asked them to. Correct? To some extent, correct, yes. <laughs> <laughs> to okay. some extent, yeah. All right. You do not want to be in a position, because remember what I said, man with one watch knows the time, man with two watches is not, never quite sure. That's true, yes. Right? The bank now has two prices. They don't know which is, which is the right one. That's why you can't go. Is it still possible to remedy that? Absolutely. But you've just made a rod for your own back. It becomes incredibly difficult. You need to sit down with your bank. You get to get someone senior enough to influence credit 
right, um, the credit department and get your, a good enough explanation across to them for them to write manager's notes and support that application in front of credit and put literally their, not career, but, you know, their proverbials on the line. And also, do, do you think that refinancing is a good practice in terms of um, giving the sense of um, to the future lenders that we are not very stable customer for them? You know, if, if they think that we have the history of refinancing continuously with different lenders, do you think that would be a... Oh, okay. All right. Um, look, I, I, I personally haven't had that experience because a bank's loyal back to me. No. Who do they give the best deals to? New people or existing customers? It's always new people. So I just say to them, I'm happy to be loyal, just give me the same deals that you're giving to new customers. Then we won't have a problem. Sometimes I've gotten, gotten them to, even though I started, this is funny, um, I got them to start on a honeymoon rate and I said, oh, well, I'm moving because it's a competitive environment, other banks are more competitive. But if you give me my honeymoon rate again for another six months, I'll stay. Do you know what? Not all of them will say yes or no, but some of them will. And then if they say no, you go, no problem. Listen, while I'm here, could you just ring on, on your internal line the mortgage retention team of your bank? Because I'm sure they'll give it to me straight away anyway. Because some bankers don't even understand there is a mortgage retention team that will do everything to slow down the process and make it really hard for you to move it elsewhere. And they'll do things for you, such as give you cheaper rates, etc. Like... Um, I was just talking to a, a friend of mine and he's revalu sorry, he's a mortgage broker and he's doing some my sister's loans, right? Now he could have just refinanced them straight off, but he said, look, you know what? I'm gonna save a lot of time and money and I'll just ring directly the mortgage retention team, because he knows people in that team, and he'll just negotiate a better rate for a bang straight away without having to move any of her accounts or redo anything. Because you just gotta to get to the right people that have the authority to do something. Make sense? Okay. Um, hi. Hi. Um, if, say, someone was in the middle of renovations, um, I'm not saying that I am, just so you don't give me direct advice. Fantastic. Um, Love people from Geelong. They are smart. <laughs> <laughs> um, would it be worth getting evaluation done now and let them know that it's going to be done soon so I can get on with going out and finding better deals? Or should I just wait until they're finished? Okay, um, that's an intriguing question because it depends on your relationship with the valuer. Let me explain if why. If you have none. Okay, um, if you can get a valuer to come out, and I've actually had this happen to me, that um, the valuer has come out and said, oh, look, the property is, is like this. It's, it's at the beginning or midway through renovation. It's only valued this. Call me out again once the valuation is complete. Yeah, no problem. I've had other situations where, excuse me, had a valuer shown him what I was going to do, agreed with me, and given me what I thought was the end valuation based on all the comparable sales. Now the bank didn't, let me tell you, the bank didn't actually read the valuation in as much detail as they should have. Whose fault is that? It was written there, right? To say that this property will, should be worth this amount once these renovations that they've described are completed to the level that they've described to us. Words to that effect, you know what they looked at? The price, great. They didn't bother reading it. They saw it was assigned to them. They saw the price. They checked for the clauses. Yeah, that'll do. So is it possible? You bet. But the reality is, the norm is, that you'll probably, from a refinancing point of view, if you've got enough money in the, in the deal at the moment, I'd probably leave it alone because otherwise you're going to pay two lots of valuations. right? And then you get the valuer out at the other end to value it once it's complete. But there could be another benefit in getting a valuer out early. Do you know what that is? Would you like to know? Yes, I would. Yeah, okay. The valuer can tell you what sort of things that you're looking at putting in that will add the most value. So, they, what's your name, please? Tiffany. Tiffany. So they might say, Tiffany, look, don't put this in because it's going to cost you this amount, but it's only going to give you this amount of, of extra value. But Tiff, you know, do this, 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 and this, and this will, because of this area and because this is where the fashion is, this will give you the greatest references. So... Just having that conversation with them could save you a lot of money, time and effort in doing the right things to maximise the valuation. And literally that, that consultation might only cost you, you know, two or three hundred dollars because they're not generating a val yet, right, but you're just getting an opinion from them. But now they've got some buy-in to it as well 
and you show them, this is what I want to do, this is what it's going to look like, um, what do you think, and what do you think the end price will be? Now they're a little bit, on, little bit more on the hook than any other valuer. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, My pleasure. Hi. Yes, piggybacking on the previous uh, lady talking about the valuer. valuer yeah. Um, I normally meet my valuers. I, being a real estate, I can get CMA, so I come with this sort of stuff, and yeah. I coach them in, in the right direction. Good. And that always worked. Um, one time, my um, property manager, who I informed to let me know when the valuer is coming, forgot to let me know, and I was a bit slack, so I didn't follow it up. So finally, when I found out the valuer was there, I get the properties value, two of them in Mindar, which is coastal region. Yep. Uh, one was 5,000 less than the previous eight months, and one was right at the same value. This is when Perth is going about 40, 50% yep. a year. So I try to reason with um, Rams, uh, uh, sorry, horny people. Uh, and uh, it took me basically, <laughs> it took me basically a month and a half to prove it to them that my value, that my appraisal was correct. They got the new value. By the time it went back to the uh, mortgage insurers, they rejected yep. the new valuation. That cost me basically 35000 because I shifted to another um, lender. But more than that, three months of not being able to get the land which I wanted and then another month which I lost, the land went $60,000 up. Yep. By the time I got it, I was about $100,000. So. My advice to anybody, get to know your valuers, meet him. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Thank you. I mean, I actually think that brilliantly illustrates not just, um, see, most people just don't get how pivotal and how absolutely important getting the valuation and controlling that process is. There is nothing, in my opinion, actually more important than this, because there are lots of lenders, but they'll all rely on this. If you've held, if you used a widely used lender, uh, sorry, widely used valuer that is used on lots of lenders' panels. This is by far the most important because whatever they say is now gospel, right? And if you can get it done, bang, really quick, really efficiently and easily up front, everything else is so much simpler and easier. That's why you've got to intercept this process, understand it and do whatever it takes to maximise at the very beginning. Does that all make sense? All right. One last question. Gentleman over here in the green. Thank you for that, Alan. It's good. But uh, actually, um, and it also highlighted the, um, the opportunity cost. Remember that it's not just any physical cost that you may have, maybe having to kick more equity in, but if you've missed out on a deal, what does that really mean to you? If, if the market's growing by 40 or 50% per annum, like missing out on something, my God, what have you really missed out on in terms of opportunity? Well, on the time, the time, the effort, the stress, the focus. What can you do about banks that have in-house valuers? Do they still have a panel? Oh, okay. Um, this is actually a really interesting one because um, I've told the story, I think, once or twice, but so many people may not have heard this story. Um, I was actually um, settling a property in Parramatta and um, it was over Christmas, New Year, that sort of period. No valuation shops are open. They've all shut down. And I had to settle this property because it was run by these... Um, solicitors and they'd done this thing where, I, I explained earlier on, I had to settle because I was paying plenty of penalty interest, right? Anyway, um, I was a little bit stressed and I rang all the valuation firms, none of them were open. Um, I think there was one but they weren't on the panel that I needed, so I was in a bit of strife. Anyway, um, I rang and spoke to a banker that I had a, ter a tremendously good relationship with and what we ended up doing was getting now, I don't know which banks do this, um, but National Australia Bank does. What they do is they often employ ex-bank managers to go out and do appraisals or to do valuations that the bank will happily accept. And here's the crazy thing. They don't have professional indemnity insurance. They're not members of the Australian Property Institute. They probably just work for the bank 30, 40, 50 years, right? And the bank just wants to look after them. They just want to do something part-time to keep their identity bubbling along. So I met this guy, um, and it was... I remember Sydney, Western Suburbs, it's hot. 
out near Parramatta, right? And I met him at this building. And uh, anyway, I, I, what, before I went through, I just started having a chat with him. And um, he was ex-CBA, and we talked about um, banking. And, you know, and I, I know what large institutions are like. And when CBA, was CBA which one did NAB take over, CBC or CBA? CBA. Was it C, no, Westpac did CBA. CBC. It was CBC. Right. Anyway, I said to him that, you know, as a kid, I had a CBC ATM card and he got really excited because he used to be a CBC manager and he then reminisced about his old branch and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, um, had a long conversation with him about, you know, how when institutions get together and I said, NAB's never been quite the same and CBC was really good and he liked those words, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know, I was buttering him up. Uh, but let's just say I built great rapport with him, right, talking about banking. And uh, anyway, by the time I then walked him through my apartment, and I actually had all my comparable sales and everything, so I'd done, I'd done all this research beforehand because I was expecting, you know, a valuer, but, and I thought he was probably a valuer, but he wasn't. He was actually just an ex-bank manager, right, with no professional indemnity insurance, nothing really to lose, but just, you know, as a bit of a mate's favour, they every now and then ask for ex-bank managers. Let me tell you, I got him at a higher price than I would have ever, ever have gotten a valuer. Ever. He was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. No worries. Yeah, I'll ring him up and let him know. No problem. <laughs> I was, thank God. So, but the norm is not that. The norm is that you're going to have... Um, a registered value through Australian Property Institute, etc. Now, that is much more likely to happen with a bank that manages its own book because most of the other non-bank lenders, um, they actually have much stricter criteria around that. Um, they often, like with RAMs, all of their loans are mortgage insured. Um, they often borrow money from other um, trusts, such as pension funds in the US. They have to have a much stricter procedure to follow. That's why often dealing with larger banks, there's, if you understand there's little tiny... Um, niches, and you can exploit those niches, because I always ask the question, so what does that mean? How do I use it? So by using someone who wasn't as, not jaded, but as professional as a valuer who had their professional indemnity on the line, right, I just showed him all my comp sales, showed him through, you know, told him about the views, etc. You know, we had a lovely chat. He said, yeah, no worries. Yep, yeah, makes sense. Doesn't happen very often. But things like that and knowing that the CBA does desk vows and building a relationship with a banker or, or maybe asking your broker to you know, see they can get that across the line, all these little things add up to a system where you're tweaking every little part of that and getting an overall much better result. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Um, now, before I go on, I just want to ask everyone, who here over these last... How many? What are we? Friday, Saturday, Sunday. What day is it today? Monday. Over these last... Um, Three and a half days? Yeah. Nearly four days. Who's actually had a breakthrough in terms of learning something? They go, wow, that's actually really amazing. Who's actually had that? All right, great. I want to ask you a question um, because I've had a lot of people coming up to me saying they're really enjoying the information, that they're really enjoying the speakers, and that's fantastic, and I appreciate that. But what I appreciate more is I want you to think, who has learnt something that they can implement immediately and how much money you're going to make from that do you think and how's that going to change your life? Who's actually in that sort of position? Put up your hand, give it, give it some thought. Can we just get the mics around because I want everyone in this room to get some references from other people who've learned something that they feel they can implement immediately because if you can implement it immediately, you are much more likely to get the result rather than down the track. Would you agree? So just tell me, what have you learned? What are you going to implement immediately? How do you think that's going to make money for you? And how's that going to change going forward in your life? Start with this gentleman up the top. And you'll just say uh, your name first, please. I'm Brett. Uh, Brett. from New Hi, South Brett. Wales with Raylene. Hi, Raylene. We bought a house in uh, May this year in Roseville. Um, we, oh, <laughs> nothing wrong with it. We bought it off two gay guys who, yeah, they're really lovely guys, but they actually travel around the world. And when we actually spoke to them when they came back to show us around the house, uh, we realised that they actually sold it to us quite a lot cheaper than we bought it for. Um, in the street that we live in is a cul-de-sac, but all the way up to the top of the street, uh, there's been about four or five house sales that have been probably around about 250 more than ours. Um, wow. And I know for a fact that we're, we're at the very end of the street where the cul-de-sac is, 
It's much leafier, quieter, better, better section, beautiful pool. And I went and saw a house actually um, three or four weekends ago, which is going for sale. And they're asking another 150 grand more than us, and the, the house is not even close. So um, by going to see a, um, a valuer, we could probably definitely get 150, maybe 200 grand extra. Wow. Which means we can use that to buy more property, I suppose. Bingo. Well done. Congratulations. Well done. Excellent. Just your name and the state you're from? I'm um, Grant from uh, Victoria. Um, I went to a seminar some years ago, and as a result, I ended up buying a property down on the coast, which has done very well. And um, I've been waiting now for the, the equity to grow sufficiently, but I hadn't had, uh, I think, just the depth and the, and the breadth of information to get me to the next level, which I think I've achieved now. Um, and partly that's because I was basically running out of cash flow with other things. Now I've found so many ways just to move forward, get cash flow, equity partners, etc. The whole um, using people to leverage with their knowledge and everything else, it's uh, something that I've already planned to do, is get what you said, the $65,000 as a minimum, Yep. moving forward Great. so that I can spend two months overseas, get married, the whole thing. It's all happening. Wow. Is that... Is that... No. Oh, sorry. I... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. That. That's brilliant, yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah. Congratulations. All right. You're sitting together. Okay, he's your friend. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Red. Uh, next, next one. Over here, Alan. Quite, actually, a relatively small thing about what you said, I think, on the first day about the um, uh, bank guarantees being... Um, continuously used for the life of a project. Yep. And to me what it means is because I, for the last three years I've been doing house and land packages of the plan with the builders and in traditional sense buy the land, then do progress payments. Okay, with buying the land, yes, we can do the um, initial 20%, but now if my builder can actually get every few months, back guarantee he can draw the money on it, Yep. Um, my Investors would be a lot easier to be persuaded because yep. it's cost them bugger all. Yeah. In a year, year and a half, they'll get value which is bound to be higher than what they pay up, what's agreed fixed value at the beginning. Plus, we can do that settlement of land which normally in house land packages isn't always available. So sure. the builder benefits, the investors benefit, I benefit. And you benefit. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. Well done. Anyone else had a breakthrough that they've learned up there? And what does it mean? How are you going to use it? Thanks. Um, Your name and state. Um, Helen from Western Australia. Um, the breakthrough I've had today is just the clarity that I've got with the processes that are involved. And in particular, um, like Alan, with the bank guarantees, I'm involved in doing small developments, um, and that will be very useful to be able to move forward. I felt that I'd been stuck at a level um, in my um, investments, and now that's changed. And also in this last one, we're getting a, com a construction valuation to get clear on what the end value is going to be to be able then to go and get the construction loan that's required. Um, it's just been a great shift, great shift for me in that one. Great. So that will maybe allow you to do more developments in the future or have greater certainty or work out your profitability, et cetera, et cetera. Very much so. Terrific. Yeah. Okay, Terrific. thank you, Helen. Great. All right. Anyone else has had a breakthrough? What does it mean? How are you going to use it? Anyone else want to share? I certainly learned a lot, and also I didn't learn some aspect, but I'm definitely going to, to study and learn. But definitely possibilities are endless. That's what I learned in terms of property. I have already spoken with two other people, not here, but um, um, to have two more projects separately from each other. So our um, conditions are a bit different, so we can support each other in terms of financially and the situation. So definitely it's going to happen. And that benefits all three of us really very Great. well. So Great, that's the next level, doing joint ventures. Absolutely. Venture, well done. Definitely, yes. Well done. Okay, great. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> <laughs>